and you're, you're very welcome to this event with Adam Bolton. I don't think I need to introduce you, Adam. I think everybody in this room watches your shows. Um, before we start, can I just mention that next Monday uh, we have a joint conference uh, with the ESB, our annual conference with the ESB, and it's called Live Electric, Designing a Low Carbon Future. Uh, and I just wanted to bring that to your attention before, before we start. Um, Adam's going to talk about the topic which is consuming everybody in these islands, uh, Brexit. He'll talk for about 20 minutes or thereabouts, and we'll take questions afterwards. But we have to finish at 2 o'clock uh, on the dot. Um, the question and answers uh, will be under the Chatham House rule, and the main event, of course, the main speech, will be uh, on the record. Could you just check that your phones are on silent or whatever? And uh, Adam, thank you for coming. Uh, Ducky, thank you very much indeed uh, uh, for that introduction. We still miss you uh, in London from your uh, time there uh, as uh, ambassador. I have many uh, happy memories of uh, your uh, period. Uh, one of them was um, Seamus Heaney when he brought out his uh, book, uh, as District and Circle, a uh, book of poems, and it happened to coincide with the uh, preparations for uh, one of... Um, uh, Queen Elizabeth's uh, Jubilees, I can't remember which one, the 60th or the 50th or something, and uh, we could hear the bands playing uh, away from uh, the embassy uh, towards Buckingham Palace, and uh, Heaney just said uh, very quietly, uh, thank you, Dohi, for giving us something to celebrate. Um, <laughs> it's, it, it's the... Uh, and uh, well, <laughs> other memories, but perhaps I won't go into those. Um, it, it's the second time, second time I've spoken at this uh, august institution. Last time uh, was in the uh, build-up uh, to uh, the Brexit referendum, and I remember I think put some of you uh, off your meal by pointing out that it was entirely possible uh, that the British could actually vote to leave the European Union. Uh, gives me no satisfaction uh, to say that I was correct. Uh, one thing I'm going to try and do over the next few minutes is possibly end up with uh, a way in which we might actually end up not leaving the European Union. Uh, but there's uh, a lot to talk about uh, before uh, we get there. Now, the first thing to say is that uh, I'm always extremely you know, hesitant speaking to an Irish audience, or indeed a, a non-UK uh, audience, or even a non-English audience in some circumstances. I'm currently uh, uh, under attack uh, on Twitter for an interview I did yesterday with Joanna Cherry over her uh, court case, where I was suggesting that it was possible she could be wrong, but uh, that doesn't tend to go down. In fact, uh, at the time of the uh, first round of public negotiations over the Irish backstop, uh, I came under a great deal of attack uh, uh, from Irish people on Twitter referring to uh, all sorts of things, uh, 1916, the potato famine and all the rest. Um, and I made a mistake at some point of trying to say, well, actually, we're in the here and now, we're talking about this. And uh, I did use the phrase, you Irish need to get over yourselves, which was a mistake. Uh, <laughs> uh, but but uh, uh, as ever with the... Uh, Fair-mindedness, uh, for which you're all well known. Uh, I was delighted that a columnist in uh, the Irish Times did end up writing a column saying, Adam Bolton is right, we Irish do need to get over ourselves. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, what has gone wrong uh, in the United Kingdom? Uh, I won't go into, well, I will later on, but I won't, won't go into the, the, the specifics of why we voted uh, by a narrow majority to leave the European Union but why, three and a half years later, we still haven't left the European Union uh, and there's no consensus at all as to how or when uh, we should uh, leave the Union. Well, I think with hindsight, uh, we can see that uh, we failed uh, to think what Brexit meant. Uh, and I have to say, I think a lot of that blame uh, will go down to our last Prime Minister, uh, Theresa May. I think we were all 
uh, frustrated to the point of vexation with her phrase about Brexit uh, means Brexit. Uh, but the reality was when uh, Mrs May became Prime Minister, uh, there was a feeling that she was uh, a politician from the centre, one capable uh, of reaching consensus and that uh, she would find a way through that could unite the nation. And indeed, that was what she promised she would do. Uh, unfortunately, she didn't. Uh, she set off pretty rapidly uh, on a course which we had seen with her predecessor, David Cameron, of trying to preserve her own position as Prime Minister by preserving her own position as she saw it uh, within the Conservative Party. So uh, her advisers, uh, who now rejoice in being commanders of the British Empire, uh, persuaded her that uh, the best way to be in a solid position was to play to the 52% and to condemn uh, the 48%. And she did that within months uh, of uh, becoming Prime Minister, as you may remember, at her first uh, Conservative Party conference where she uh, talked about uh, citizens of nowhere uh, with a direct link to them being people uh, who had voted in favour of remaining uh, in the European Union. That was uh, fairly rapidly followed uh, by uh, an adoption, uh, again, to please uh, her uh, conservative uh, hardliners of uh, red lines, which meant that the whole process of Brexit moved from beyond being an extraction of the UK from the political institutions of the European Union, which I've always believed would have been perfectly possible. It would have come um, at a certain cost, and it's difficult to see necessarily what the advantages of it would, would have been, although it would have satisfied, uh, in my view, uh, the perception of what Brexit meant, instead of which we embarked on, as you know, withdrawing from the customs union single market uh, and increasingly uh, talking about uh, the breaking of ties uh, with the European Union. Now, that had the impact on public opinion uh, of polarizing the argument further. It was a simple approach, basically saying, fundamentally, they're a terrible shower. We've been paying for the privilege of mixing with them, and it's time for us to get out uh, completely uh, mixed with uh, metaphors in some of the popular press, but by no means all uh, relating to uh, our finest star, the Second World War, uh, and uh, uh, all the rest of it. It also had uh, the impact on the other side of the argument of making Brexit less acceptable. In other words, uh, the inclination of conservative pro-Europeans, let alone the opposition parties, to come to the table and agree some kind of acceptable Brexit uh, disappeared as they realised that what was apparently acceptable uh, to the Conservative Party was unacceptable uh, to them or they believed uh, against uh, the national interest. And that really is uh, where we have been uh, for uh, a very long time. Uh, as you know, uh, the Mrs May did eventually agree a withdrawal agreement uh, with the European Union uh, at the end of last year, which was pretty much uh, respecting of her red lines and pretty much what she wanted. But by that stage, um, her ability to get it through Parliament uh, had diminished. And those people who now feel that there's a chance in the remaining days that this might get through Parliament, uh, I, I think do need to remember the reason why uh, it didn't was because uh, the Tory Eurosceptics, as represented by the European uh, Reform Group or whatever, uh, were not satisfied that they were getting sufficient and effectively uh, were by that stage, as they continue to be, uh, playing for a clean break, uh, just as uh, Nigel, Far as they call it, just as Nigel Farage uh, calls it. Now, as you know, and, and again, you know, I, I, I raise this cautiously, but I know that uh, the impact of Brexit is uh, very severe or potentially very severe for Ireland, as severe 
as it is going to be for the United Kingdom. So in one sense, I come here with a sense of shame and apology for uh, what we put you through. I think there's a lot of evidence that, uh, in spite of the best efforts of John Major and Tony Blair, that uh, the whole question of Ireland was completely absent uh, from uh, the mainstream debate uh, during the referendum campaign. Uh, and when we come, I'm not going to go in because I know you know much more about it than, than I do, uh, into the minutiae of uh, negotiations over the Irish border uh, and the Irish backstop. I'm sure it will come up in questions. But uh, to come right up to where we are today, there are two basic questions to which I don't know the answer and everyone I have spoken to, including people uh, who've been working with uh, Boris Johnson in Downing Street, don't know the answer. The first question is, what is his intention? Is he actually sincerely attempting to reach some sort of an agreement uh, with the European Union? And the related question to that uh, is, if he does get that, can he deliver a parliamentary majority for it, which is the minimum uh, for him to leave, albeit with none of the T's crossed or the I's dotted, but to be able to claim, uh, A, that he is moving towards leaving the European Union or will have taken Britain out of the European Union by Halloween, and secondly, uh, that there will be a transition period in which supposedly uh, Boris Johnson in his customary uh, last-minute uh, extemporisation will attempt to rule out the bumps. The alternative, of course, which he has told us he doesn't want, but which he regards as entirely uh, acceptable, uh, is that he would uh, take us out uh, without any agreement, without any transition, uh, with uh, everything uh, still to be resolved. And certainly from the European Union's perspective, uh, the very issues uh, which uh, have not been agreed uh, during the course of the negotiations to be negotiated as the first term of business uh, for the future relationship between the UK and the European Union. Now, Amber Rudd, who of course uh, resigned from the Cabinet, said she saw uh, no evidence of uh, proper preparations uh, for a deal. Um, I've been speaking to people who were on the inside who uh, basically didn't stay because Dominic Cummings was given the top role. Uh, they say they saw no evidence of Boris Johnson uh, sincerely uh, seeking to agree a deal. Um, and against that, we have the proposals, which we know he's brought forward, relating to uh, agro-foods uh, and uh, checks away from the border. Um, I think one thing which has made a deal slightly more interesting or possible is the uh, loss of his parliamentary majority, which means that uh, he's no longer in favour of, uh, he's no longer tied to the Democratic Unionist Party uh, in terms of uh, trying to uh, build a majority or to being dependent on them for an automatic majority in Parliament, which probably gives him a little leeway. But second question is, can, you get, can he get it through Parliament? As I've already said, I think that that well is sufficiently tainted that it looks unlikely. And I also think that the a decision of Parliament to come together behind Hillary Benn's bill, uh, meaning that they think uh, that they can put off uh, a no-deal Brexit at the end of the month, although there, there's some nervousness about it, actually reduces clearly the incentive for them to say, well, it's, it's, uh, we better vote for this deal because the alternative is no deal if they believe uh, that they can put off uh, a satisfactory uh, conclusion. But one thing I do want to highlight in all this really does pertain very much to this island, and I'm astonished, frankly, that there hasn't been uh, wider comment uh, on the drift of Conservative Party policy uh, towards Ireland, which really completely abandons the attitude adopted by successive uh, Conservative governments, uh, certainly in the uh, latter part, well, basically for most of the last 30 years. Um, no one has commented that the Conservative Party and Mrs May 
and her ministers have effectively withdrawn uh, the commitment first made by Conservative uh, Peter Brook in 1991 of having no selfish strategic interest uh, in the maintenance of Northern Ireland as part of the United Kingdom. And, and it is absolutely on the record that that's been withdrawn. In fact, I interviewed Arlene Foster about that a year or so ago in her constituency, and I referred to it as the uh, government's uh, stated position to which she replied, oh no, that's just something that was written on a piece of paper uh, by some civil servants. Um, most recently, uh, an exchange uh, in July, uh, Ian Paisley Jr. Uh, said to the Secretary of State, then uh, Karen Bradley, uh, I welcome the Secretary of State's uh, claim which sets aside uh, what was uh, previously said about uh, no selfish strategic interest. And she replied, I am a member of the Conservative and Unionist Party. Uh, I have uh, never uh, um, hide, I've never hidden my respect for the union. And that, I think, puts everything in a different context because if honouring the Belfast Agreement, which effectively uh, was built around the fact that we were uh, both members of the European Union, if that is no longer uh, an issue, it uh, does put into play uh, all the issues on, on this island that we uh, know so well uh, from uh, previous centuries. Uh, and uh, as you know, uh, Article 3 of the uh, Belfast Agreement talked about uh, uh, the development uh, of Europe, which will of itself require new approaches uh, to some uh, common interests. Clearly, although they don't wish to discuss that at any great length, the present uh, Conservative Party uh, appears to me to be embarked on abandoning that. And, and that, I think, is, is, is really the point, that there are no longer any rules or any undertakings which apply uh, as far as uh, the British government's uh, approach is concerned. Uh, we know there's a lot of argument about uh, the role of Stormont, uh, which, of course, uh, Boris Johnson has said must have uh, a veto on the backstop now whether or not that's accepted, acceptable to the European Union uh, it's a bit of a problem if you uh, effectively are colluding in not re-establishing the assembly uh, in any way and I don't, know, I don't know how to put this really the moment I felt you know kind of most ashamed to be British in this whole process was when uh, Karen Bradley said that she'd only just discovered that sectarianism played a part in Northern Ireland politics <laughs> uh, uh, after she had accepted the job of being Northern Ireland secretary. Uh, you know, if we look at our present cabinet, we have a home secretary, uh, Priti Patel, who was sacked from the cabinet for conducting private negotiations with a foreign power as a junior minister. Uh, we have an Education Secretary, Gavin Williamson, who is Defence Secretary, uh, was found uh, guilty of uh, leaking National Security Council uh, secrets. And yet, we are supposed to treat these people uh, as uh, people of honour uh, and respect. That, of course, uh, brings us to the court cases currently underway, uh, which I think are in some ways a sideshow to the Brexit process, even if the Supreme Court were to rule that it was wrong to prorogue Parliament and Parliament has to return uh, during the party conference season. I can't see in practical terms what difference other than uh, you know, further arming the animosities the return of Parliament would have given the clear deadlines of negotiations with the European Union and the build-up to the Council, uh, the deadline of the 19th of November in the Ben Act for parliamentary approval, and then, of course, uh, the 31st of October for, Brit for Britain to leave. So where it would uh, have an impact uh, would be in um, giving Parliament a, a further opportunity as they see it, to humiliate uh, Boris Johnson, to 
uh, ask for further documentation around uh, Operation Yellowhammer, the consequences of hard Brexit, uh, to, to press them in those areas. But the problem uh, to me is that if that takes place, I think that would simply uh, increase the atmosphere of confrontation vis-a-vis uh, the um, European Union and actually uh, add power to the elbow of those people uh, prepared to behave uh, possibly illegally and very rashly uh, in terms of pursuing uh, a no-deal Brexit. Incidentally, uh, and I'm no lawyer, uh, I would be astonished uh, that if the courts do uh, rule in favour of the Scottish, Scottish judges, um, I think there is a genuine constitutional question uh, about how far the uh, court should get involved in, in political decisions and it's effectively been accepted that it's not the ordering of the prorogation, it's the motives for the prorogation uh, which are on trial. I'm told by every legal expert I've spoken to ranging from Lord Falconer uh, to uh, Kenneth Clark to uh, Jonathan Sumption, Lord Sumption, that they don't see uh, much chance of uh, the court upholding uh, either Gina Miller uh, or uh, the Scottish uh, judgment. But uh, I've been wrong many times before in this process, uh, so we'll have, uh, I think, to watch this space. So in all of this, is there a way out? Well, we have to remember that we got a government which said it wasn't going to prorogue Parliament, then prorogue Parliament, a government which said it was against holding a general election, uh, and then uh, said it wanted to hold a general election and challenged the opposition parties to do it. Uh, we have opposition leaderships who are more interested in having a general election once this phase of Brexit has been resolved. I mean, that is, you know, that's the function of what Jeremy Corbyn said today about the Labour Party. Uh, supporting uh, a referendum but offering a choice between a renegotiated deal uh, and remain and it's what lies behind uh, the new leader of the Liberal Democrats saying that uh, the Liberal Democrats would be the party of revoke that's that that's not about what's going on now that's about positioning for when the general election happens it's not helpful if you like to uh, sort out the next few weeks however to end for the questions on the note of optimism it seems to me that two things are emerging at the moment. The first is, I think, an extreme reluctance on Boris Johnson's part to actually take Britain out of the European Union without a deal because he, uh, I mean, we know him, as, know him of old, but he uh, remains a rational man. I think he can see the consequences. And movements away from the party leaderships towards uh, some kind of compromise. And that compromise uh, was uh, known when it was discussed earlier on and narrowly rejected uh, as uh, Kyle uh, Wilson, which would be uh, that Johnson would bring forward some sort of agreement, either actively supporting it or remaining neutral, possibly a repeat of Mrs May's agreement, possibly um, uh, something after he's got some uh, warm words uh, on the question of the Irish border. But that, that would be amended to have a second referendum. I think it's quite clear now that more and more non-front bench uh, MPs are moving in that position, uh, which also uh, would, it is assumed in London, uh, but I'm sure that people here, John Bruton's here can tell me otherwise, it's assumed in London that if we are firmly committed to some form of further vote uh, before the deadline of the end of October, it makes it more likely or easier for the European Union uh, to grant an extension. Um, and that could be a way, uh, I wouldn't guarantee, I certainly wouldn't guarantee the outcome, but it could be a way in which this matter 
uh, would be resolved, first of all, to the satisfaction of both sides in Parliament uh, and then uh, to uh, the British public. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I, at the moment it seems like uh, the only obvious avenue away from a period of serious uh, political uh, unrest in the UK, which could simply result in a series of inconclusive battles for uh, redoubts, possibly several more prime ministers, several more general elections, uh, while uh, the rest of Europe and, of course, Ireland uh, wonders where we're heading. So I'll leave it there, I think.